started and I'm going to start right now. Um, good morning. I'm Alice Nolan, and on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Manatee County, I welcome you to Hot Topics. We hold Hot Topics uh, the second Monday of the month uh, for six months of the year. Uh, before we start, I'd like to tell you about two of our upcoming programs. On March 31st, we have uh, implicit bias training, uh, which is being done by Dr. Fidel, a professor of criminology at uh, South Florida, at the University of South Florida, and a nationally recognized expert on biased policing. Uh, it's open to all individuals, organizations, and so please share the information about this program. Our annual meeting is going to be on Saturday, April 24th at 10 a.m. And then at 10.30, uh, we, we um, have uh, Angela Colonesso, the Clerk of Court and Controller of Manatee County. Um, so there's more to come on uh, our annual celebration of a very active year and uh, this exciting program. Our program today uh, is uh, the 2020 election and beyond. Uh, felony disenfranchisement was introduced in Florida in 1838 with the ratification of the first constitution in Florida, uh, but it was more limited. After the Civil War in an effort to, in the words of a South Carolina constitution uh, revision member, deprive every colored man of their right of citizenship by making the most trivial offense a felony, Florida also expanded what constituted a felony. By 1869, 29 states had enacted disenfranchisement laws. Uh, today, about 1.6 million people in Florida have a current or previous felony conviction. That's more than 10% of our state population. Amendment 4 passed in November of 2018 returned voting rights to returning citizens if they had not been convicted of a murder or a sex crime. Um, the Florida legislature enabling legislation, however, required all fines and fees be paid before voting rights could be restored. Uh, that impacted about 774,000 citizens. Uh, only because they had outstanding financial obligations. Uh, our speakers today were key players in the passage of Amendment 4 and the huge task of registering returning citizen, citizens, finding their financial obligations and paying them. Uh, this effort is far from complete. Our speakers today are Cecile Schoon and Neil Vols. Cecile, is a civil rights lawyer and first vice president of the League of Women Voters of Florida. She's a Virginia law school graduate and she spent five years in the Air Force JAG prosecuting military courts martial. She retired from the Air Force Reserves as a major in 20, 2005. She is the chair of the League's efforts on restoration rights. Neil Bowles is the deputy director of the Florida Rights Restitution Coalition and a returning citizens who vote was restored in 2020. Neil helped negotiate and secure the passage of the Help America Vote Act, which improved voting accessibility and accuracy for millions of citizens. He is an active member of quite a few social service nonprofit organizations, and he is co-founder of the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, the organization that is dedicated to securing voter rights for returning citizens. Uh, we will be having, taking questions at the end of the presentation, so please put your questions in chat and uh, keep them a little brief. So, um, so Cecile? If you would unmute yourself, we'd be happy to hear from you. Good morning, and thank you for this opportunity, Alice, and on behalf of Manatee League of Women Voters. And it's a pleasure to be in a, an event with Neil. We've, we've 
bumped along uh, this journey um, so many times working and it's been very inspirational. Well, as many of you know, um, the league has had a long history with Amendment 4. We were involved at the very beginning when Desmond was trying to get this uh, written up and um, established. And then the league pulled away for a short time and individual league members were working with Desmond and uh, working very, very hard. And we got back involved in the game for the last stretch, the last year or so, working very hard to get petitions signed. And once, once it got on the ballot, then we all worked very, very hard to, to get it passed. And I'm very, very proud of league members' passion and commitment in doing that. We had an opportunity at that time, we were working with um, Desmond and the Second Chance campaign, which was trying to get convince people and tell and educate people about what Amendment 4 was about. And we ended up having quite a lot of meetings and that's when I would see Neil and Desmond and many of our other allies that worked hard together to get this passed. Um, yay, it got, it got passed. It was one of the most popular things uh, that at that time. Uh, and uh, immediately after that, we were like, this is so awesome. One of the things we said was, um, let's do some education. In fact, I was actually sitting, Neil, I don't know if you were in the room, but I was sitting right next to Desmond and there was about 20 of the allies there, different groups that had been working with it, ACLU, um, some of the unions, um, New Florida Majority, um, Faith in Action, different different wonderful groups that worked really hard. And we all said, you know, we need to do um, something to educate the people about what this means because it had passed, but we wanted people to know, you know, exactly what, what the benefits were. And so um, Desmond looked at me and he said, you know, you know, the league does a lot of education. Why don't you guys work on that? And I said, sure. So we started creating a PowerPoint and creating an education piece. And that was, we worked on that. And then shortly after that, we learned that the legislators, they wanted to help us. They wanted to help, they said, Amendment 4 with implementing legislation. And so that quickly took, took off and that whole next spring, we were basically battling different um, legislative suggestions and proposals, some of which were very, very damaging. One of the things that, you know, when you say, does it matter when you go? And, and we did beat back quite a few things. And again, there were many, many groups there, Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, and Neil spoke brilliantly and passionately and Desmond many times to the different uh, committees. One of the things we beat back was um, the, one of the bills that was recommended by Representative Grant at the time would say that all the um, interest and all the administrative costs that the clerks of courts would put on just holding the file and bringing it, so would had to be paid before you could vote. So you could have taken a $500 financial obligation and over time, 30, 40 years, that could be $5,000. And we brought that to their attention in, in horror and they're, oh, we didn't mean that, we didn't mean that, but that's literally what it said. Interest and costs must be paid. Well, the very next day they took it out. So I can, I'm happy to report to you that we did make some dents and that was one of them that we, we fought back some of the things we were very um, disappointed because uh, in the end, one of the more damaging versions got through. And up until that time, there was something that had protected a lot of our Florida rights and would have really helped our uh, returning citizen um, uh, that we wanted to have that opportunity to vote. And that was, there, was a pro there is a process in the state of Florida where judges can look at a person when they're sentencing them and they can determine that they want to convert their fines and fees and their financial obligations to a civil matter. And that means when the person finishes their incarceration and their probation, 
they have no more criminal matters left because it's been converted to a civil matter. And judges would do that because they were concerned. They wanted to make sure that people, when they finished their incarceration and probation, they could say, in answer to an application for a job, did you finish your, all of your sentence? Yes, I, they had because the financial part was no longer in the criminal side. It was put over in the civil side. And it didn't seem to matter in terms of impacting the government or anybody because people's ability to pay these fines and fees didn't change whether it was criminal or civil. They were having a difficult time paying it and it was still an obligation that was still on record. So it, it's not like the state was losing anything by this conversion. It was just a kindness so the person could get on with their lives. Well, that protection was there till the very last day when Senate Bill 7066 passed. It was kept in there. Senator Brandis had kept that protection that if there had been a conversion to a civil lien, then their sentence was complete, literally. So that would have impacted maybe upwards, we made estimates of 800,000 to a million of the citizens who were returning citizens of the 1.4, because then they would have been able to vote automatically because they had, it, this, the bill had acknowledged what the, the Florida judges had been doing for the majority of the cases. But the very last day, they pulled that bill with that protection of civil lien and put the opposite. We don't care if you have a civil lien you got to pay it. So big tears, upset. This just blew the whole thing up. And what had been a limiting uh, bill just be, ended up being like a big, huge, like building a big dam on a river. It just really shut down the flow because it didn't matter if the judge had taken the time to convert it to a civil lien. Well, they also put something in the bill, which we're grateful for, but they said that you could go back to court to get a modification. So that was unheard of. That is not something that many states have anything like that. When you're sentenced, after the case is over, you have 30 days to file an appeal. You miss that 30 days, you're stuck. Unless there's evidence of lying and fraud in the prosecution, which would be a collateral attack. And sometimes things like that come up that a witness recants or the DNA is found and you know something to show that the conviction was improper. Unless something like that happens, you're basically stuck. So this whole idea of being able to modify a sentence is just pretty cool, but there's a problem. Most of the people, when you have to go to court, most people feel like they need a lawyer. And many returning citizens are unable to afford a lawyer and lawyers haven't been trained about this. Anybody who was coming out of law school, unless you came out of law school within the last two years, you were literally taught, just like what I said, once you're sentenced, you're done. It is, was not legally possible unless you did an appeal to modify a criminal sentence, literally impossible. So this statute did tighten everything up and make people have to pay all their financial obligations, but it created a little pathway, sort of a small, narrow pathway. You gotta go back to court, you gotta usually find a lawyer, you gotta find your records, you gotta draft your pleadings, and you gotta convince a judge and you have to notify the state attorney's office because you're altering the sentence. You're asking to alter a sentence and you just can't do that unilaterally. So the pathway wasn't the best, but it, that's still there. Well, as you know, the league was very concerned about the impact and we challenged the statute and we essentially won at trial. The evidence at trial was that the, the records that, uh, that people are relying upon to determine what is a financial obligation, they were never intended to be used that way. And you have living people in their 60s, 70s, 80s with very, very old sentences and in small uh, counties with small 
courthouses where things have not been digitized. There's been fires, hurricanes, floods. Who knows where those papers are? And we actually had 19 plaintiffs that were in the case that said, we cannot find our records or we have found the records and they conflict. They don't say the same thing. And we'd even ask the state, can you tell us what these records say? And they'd say, we don't know either. So it was a bunch of confusion. And um, that was one of our biggest arguments. What happened on, at the very end of the litigation, the state came forward and said, oh, we're gonna create something. We're gonna have an advisory opinion. So you can submit and you can ask the division of elections you know, to determine what it is that you have to pay. And that, that is essentially when they proffered that as a remedy on, at, on appeal, because we won so many benefits from the trial, on appeal, they pointed to that provision and said, oh, your honor, we've taken care of that. You can now go to the state and you can ask the state with the advisory opinion. And the court chose to um, disregard some of the evidence that we thought was very strong. And it was a close decision, but the trial work was overturned. So what does that mean? That means we are back to Senate Bill 7066, which requires the full payment of all financial obligations. It does have the modification pathway that we discussed. So what ended up happening is we had already started some training to tell people about what um, Amendment 4 was doing and how it opened the doors. And then at that point, we realized we need to help lawyers understand what this new opportunity is so that they'll be in a position to help returning citizens. And so we decided, and uh, at that time I was, like I said, working with Desmond and he said, hey, you guys work with that education piece. So we, the league created what something that's called continuing legal education, referred to as CLE. And we explained what Amendment 4 was doing, what Senate Bill 76 had done, and the pathway to get a modification of records of the sentence and how to search people's criminal records. And so we decided that let's ask a lot of these lawyers to do this work for free because many returning citizens are struggling financially. They've got the felony on their record and it prevents them from getting a lot of different types of employment. And a lot of them are working very hard, but not in necessarily high paying jobs. So the Florida Bar reviewed our work and they agreed that they were gonna give us two hours of continuing legal education credit. And what that means is lawyers are required in every state. In Florida, I think we have to take 30 continuing legal education credits every three years. And an hour of CLE costs somewhere between 90 and $150. So we were giving people a $300 benefit you know, for free and we would ask them when they registered, please, would you consider donating your time to help returning citizens? We got a huge response and we've, we've trained quite a few lawyers. Um, we did a lot of trainings in person and then we put um, the CLE online and people could get the credit that way. We created a second CLE that discusses more of actually going into court, talks about the, the documents that you use, the actual petition and the steps that way. And so between the two CLEs, each of them are worth, uh, can give someone two hours of continuing legal education. That's a total of four. We have trained over a thousand attorneys, somewhere between a thousand and 1500 attorneys. And in the registration, we asked them, would you be willing to assist? Quite a few have said that they would. What we've done is we were sharing the names of these trained attorneys with the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition group. And they were using uh, many of these trained attorneys to assist them in their program. And Neil will talk about that a little bit more. So we shared the resources that way. And then we've created a system where we are now doing referrals. We are doing outreach to returning citizens. We are, um, any, anybody you know, please refer them. We have a, a dedicated um, 
um, email um, address. I mean, yes, it's can I vote? C A N I vote at Gmail. Excuse me, can I vote at lwvfl.org? Can I vote? At, I'll put it in the chat when Neil is talking. And we also have a dedicated, yes, thank you, a dedicated phone number, which I will put in the chat also. So what we've, what we've tried to do is create these pathways for people to ask. And we've had over 500 people call, well, close to 500. I don't know if we're quite at 500, but close to 500 uh, people call for different questions, returning citizens and information. Sometimes they just want a paper application. Whatever it is they need, we try to either, if they need a lawyer, we put them in touch with a lawyer. Um, we try to coach the lawyers because they have questions and they come uh, to me. We have a wonderful assistant. My assistant is Barbara Ryder. She is a retired computer science professor and a fabulous league member. And she helps me with the referrals. Um, and so that's, what we're, that's, that's the program that we're, we have established. We recently also um, used some grant money that we received. It's um, Vote Your Voice grant money. And we hired two people to help part-time. And one, her name is Erin Dowd, and she does outreach to reentry programs. There's hundreds of them across the state. And we've created a kit uh, to help them to um, information, registration, directions, how to be a third party voter registrant. Um, just, you know, because a lot of the reentry programs, everybody's heard of Amendment 4, but they don't really know how to implement it. So we're trying to, we just mailed out over 100 packets to um, the different reentry programs, and there's more. We keep finding more. And we would want to assist them in whatever way they need. They've asked us to create a flyer. We created a flyer for them. They've asked us uh, for just simple instructions and business cards. On one side of the business card, it has the league information. On the other side, it has FRRC's information because they are providing different services. We're sort of running parallel, but we're not doing the exact same thing right now. And then with the other thing that we are doing is we are reaching out to legal services across the state. In fact, in a couple of hours, I'll be speaking to a legal services organization that covers 12 different counties. Now, why are we reaching out to legal services? Well, they have uh, brick and mortar offices. They have paid attorneys who are there to help people with financial needs, help them with their legal issues. And what we're asking the legal services offices to do is to add to their intake sheet, helping people get their voting rights back because they're interfacing with people. There's a the overlap of persons who need that help and persons who are having financial difficulty. We've been getting a really, really good response and that's very, very exciting. Um, a lot of them want additional information. And so we also created packets of information for them. So that's really what we're doing in an up-to-date way we're asking league members if that you're interested, by all means, you can take the CLE. It is a training targeting lawyers, but we can have uh, non-lawyer uh, people, league members, if you wanna work in conjunction with the lawyer and help them collect the records that they would review, that could be something that, that we could you could be involved with. We're also asking our league members to let us know if you have any reentry programs in your community or connections with legal services. Because again, that's where we're trying to build out in addition to the individual attorneys that are doing the individual cases, we're trying to like build out in a systemic way. We're also talking with FRRC right now. In fact, we, we have a call tomorrow. We have a Zoom meeting tomorrow to, to figure out if there's ways that we can partner up a little bit more directly. So there's, everybody's just, we're just trying to get the work done. So those are the main things that the, the league is doing with regards to um, what, what next. We are trying to get as, again, as, as we've always done, as many voters 
involved and as many voters engaged as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Cecile. That, that was great. And I'm going to have to watch this again to get down all the stuff that our league can do to help. <laughs> There's just, there was just so much content there. That was great. Um, so thank you very much. Okay, Neil, um, would you please unmute yourself? And uh, we we're anxious to hear from you. Awesome. Thank you, Alice. And uh, it's an honor to be uh, with the league and thank you Cecile. It's good to see you again. Uh, it's always fun to tag team at these events. Um, so I will just kind of kind of blend into some of uh, what Cecile has already shared with you. I look forward to questions and uh, kind of more interactive conversation um, uh, after uh, after I, I talk a little bit. And, and my, my, my comments really will be uh, zeroed in on the returning citizen experience. And my encouragement is that uh, you kind of take this uh, information from the perspective of the more than a million and a half returning citizens in the state of Florida. Uh, like Alice mentioned, I am uh, a returning citizen who's been Im involved in this movement since about 2015. Um, I lost my rights to vote uh, when I made some stupid decisions and crossed some lines I shouldn't have crossed. Um, and then I was actually able to vote for the first time in uh, 2020, for the first time about 16 years. Uh, our executive director, Desmond, was able to uh, vote for the first time about 30 years. And I tend to describe this kind of where we are right now uh, as like a Dickens novel. It's the best of times and the worst of times. Um, because like uh, Cecile mentioned, uh, if you look at the real, the, the big, big picture, uh, without kind of going over some of the things that Cecile mentioned, you know, we had a, a, a mammoth success in November 2018. You know, we tore down the, the lifetime ban that existed for 150 plus years and expanded democracy here in the state of Florida and in the country, the largest we've seen in 50 years. I think that's something that everybody, you know, we should be uh, excited about. Um, you know, that that is incredible work. The league was so integral uh, in helping to achieve, whether it was collecting petitions, communicating, pushing, uh, doing all the things necessary to get us across that, uh, that finish line. There's no longer a lifetime ban in the Constitution around this issue, uh, and, and, and that is incredible. Uh, ultimately, hundreds of thousands of people uh, are seeing their lives tangibly improved because of that work. Um, like, like Cecile mentioned, uh, over time, we've seen that uh, that one and a half million people, and that's a kind of a general number, and I'll share some numbers about voting and voter registration, things like that, and kind of keep them a little bit general. Uh, but of that million and a half people, what we saw happen was when the, with the passage of 766 and the legislature signed by Governor DeSantis, that, that group of people was in some respects cut in half um, because uh, hundreds of thousands of people like myself, Desmond, so many other were eligible. We're eligible to go register to vote. We did participate in democracy. And then there are people who have that anguished you know, situation in which they're unable to pay for the financial obligations they still owe the court system. And so that puts them in the spot of having to decide between paying for their health care or paying for rent or doing anything like that and voting. And, and we just don't think that anybody should ever be put in that, that situation. Uh, and so we know that our fight can continues and uh, that this is a moral, this is a righteous fight, and this is ultimately a fight about real people's lives and our communities and that we know all the data and we know in, in, in anecdotal and real people's lives that when somebody is allowed to be a full participant in their community, when somebody can have the ownership over decision making in their communities and in the state, uh, we see recidivism rates drop precipitously, we see communities become safer and we see a more vibrant democracy. And we think that that's worth fighting for. And that's kind of where we are. So if I can just overlay a little bit of what Cecile said, more from the re returning citizen perspective. And, and, and some of that starts with um, kind of the, the passage of 766. The governor signs the bill. Uh, like Cecile said, at a certain point, so many of us engaged this process. We told the legislature we didn't think they needed to do self-enacting or an, an enacting legislation. They went ahead and did it anyway. So we got involved. And one of the things that we got included in the bill uh, was the modification program. Allowed people to get into the court system so that they could, um, you know, if you're a returning citizen like myself, you can get your, your, your um, sentence modified and then you could become eligible to vote. And we're very, and I'd like to report that we're just very much at the beginning of this journey around this modification program and the utilization of the courts to get people eligible to vote. 
uh, but we've seen a lot of success. I know in the last cycle, uh, we actually saw in, in Miami-Dade uh, Judicial District over a thousand people went through that system uh, and went through that process and they had their eligibility to voting restored to the court system. So this is a very powerful tool that is just really at the beginning of this journey. We look forward to in this year, um, making sure that uh, we actually have motions filed in all of the judicial districts across the state. And we begin the process of operationalizing this tool uh, wherever that we can. And the league, and Cecile in particular, is an integral part of, of that process because the attorney assistance program that she helps to lead, the CLE uh, process that she outlined, it's an incredibly invaluable uh, partnership and we're very grateful to be on that journey with y'all. Um, as it relates to how things played out, you know, after the passage of uh, 766, uh, what we saw was, like I mentioned, we got, we started to dig into how to utilize this uh, uh, provision, uh, this modification provision. We got out into the communities. Uh, we started registering returning citizens. I know uh, FRC, we registered uh, 40 plus thousand uh, people last year, tens of thousands of those returning citizens themselves. Um, and so you had kind of multi-track uh, movement going on at the same time. One is get into the court system. During that process of trying to learn how to operationalize these, uh, these this modification uh, process, we, we began to see a very practical uh, kind of reality come, come, be, be begin to develop in front of our eyes. Uh, simply focused on real people and the real lives of, of someone who might owe $700 or $400 or $1,100, and that's what's standing between them and democracy. So we put together a fines and fees program, a um, and it was very like I said, just super practical as we're looking at the modification program, like, well, wow, wouldn't it be effective if, in, if we added another tool in the toolbox? Uh, and that is a direct payment to uh, people who currently have barriers to um, democracy. So worked with all our attorneys, got everything set up uh, in the proper way. Um, and we began the process in late 2019 of a fines and fees program. And by November, December, we were starting to pay people's fines and fees. Um, and we had a GoFundMe style account where uh, there was a connection made between the community and people who were barred from democracy. Um, that's going on at exactly the same time that the court decisions are happening that uh, Cecile uh, mentioned. And let me just be super clear, like well, I'm just trying to share this from the returning citizen perspective, from the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition perspective, who has 20 plus chapters across the state of all returning citizens, um, that we knew that the court cases, right, that, 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 that this was an effort to fight for the same people we were trying to register and, and help on the ground, right? So these things are happening all uh, in, in unison. And, and what we began to see from the returning citizen perspective was that the court decisions very much became like a roller coaster ride. You had court decisions in the state, you had federal court decisions going on. And when a court decision seemed to go our way, it was a celebration hugs, tears, crying, excitement about what, you know, re-enfranchisement on a, in a very real way means for a community. And then the opposite could happen as well. Uh, when a court decision didn't go our way, you would see sadness and mad. We were mad. We were angry. We were like, why is our own government fighting these efforts to get people re-enfranchised? And, and we really saw that play out in, 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 the, in spring and summer of last year. And, and that was with the, the Hinkle decision, the federal uh, case that um, Cecile mentioned. And I'm trying to kind of bring this up to get us into 2020 and get us into questions. There's a lot here we can unpack in a lot of different ways, but ultimately Judge Hinkle ruled that uh, it was unconstitutional to block people from paying their fees and their costs. And that it was also unconstitutional to make somebody pay their fines or restitution if they in fact were unable to pay. So in the process of that ruling from the returning citizen perspective, that expanded who was eligible to vote in 2020 by six, seven, hundreds of thousands of people, right? So we had returning citizens celebrating all over the state. We were working with people to get people registered to vote under the Hinkle decision because our, our, our guiding light has always been the empowerment of returning citizens and we will operate under whatever policy and whatever law um, is passed so that we can um, make sure that we're doing things the right way. Lo and behold, six, seven weeks later, you had the 11th Circuit Court decision uh, in which, like Cecile mentioned, that decision by Hinkle that was so good was then overturned. 
right? So from the returning citizen perspective, like put yourself in the shoes of the family members, the friends, the communities, you know, individuals who went to bed at night and such a momentous election. 2020 was a big election. People thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to have my voice be heard. I get to be a full citizen in my community. My opinion matters in this process. And they then got shut, shut out. Right. So there's a federal appeals decision, you know, while it's argued and it seems like a political science exercise to some and a legal exercise to some. And it is for the folks that we spend every day with the folks we dedicate our lives to. It's a crushing blow. Right. These hopes and dreams to have your voice heard in this particular election were shut out. And we saw something pretty amazing happen. Um, we saw this fines and fees program that we had put together in 2019, been operating in 2020, we're still operating right now. It began to be seen as this tool, this, a, 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 a way that people could give the gift of democracy to another human being. That even in this partisanship, even with all the acrimony that we face, even with all the distrust, all this anger going on around us with these various court decisions, suddenly people began to get focused on the fines and fees fund. We had folks everywhere from LeBron James and John Legend to people at the local church level and, and meeting at the coffee shop to raise 50, 100 of thousand dollars and ultimately the fines and fees program we raised 27 million dollars and we were able to pay the the fines and fees for 43,000 returning citizens that was an ability to tear down the barriers for almost an entire stadium full of florida citizens who all they wanted to do was vote I'm reminded of a woman named Barbara from Indian River uh, County, who was somebody our, our teams uh, met uh, and, and, and registered her to vote. And, and she just started breaking down crying. She hadn't voted in 40 years. There's a sad part to this story though. And, and, and that is that she told our, our team she had been given six months to live by her doctor. And that all she wanted to do was have her voice heard in the in the voting process. She didn't say she wants to go meet a celebrity. She didn't say she wants to go travel the world. She didn't say a whole bunch of things. What she said was, I want to be able to vote before I die. Sadly, four days later, she passed away. But her memory and her spirit immersed itself in our movement. And we kept Barbara's hopes and dreams alive. We know that her sister actually took her urn when she went to go vote in Indian River County. And we knew that that is what we were fighting for. That at the end of the day, this whole mission is way bigger than right or left. It's way bigger than Republican or Democrat. It's ultimately about democracy, it's ultimately about human beings and how we see our humanity and our shared humanity. So we know that the march continues. And from our perspective, as we got closer and closer to the 2020 election and we had our bus tour going all across the state, we, 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 we found ourselves caught up in an incredible celebration of democracy, an incredible hopeful moment in which at every stop that we, we took, we, at, at early voting sites, you know, at supervisors' offices, returning citizens would come out and greet us and tell us their stories. And we know that when all was said and done, despite all the headwinds, despite not having a government that was working with us, and we always wonder, we look at other states where the government works hand in hand to say, we want as many people to come out and vote as possible. We saw an incredible move of democracy. We know that over 80,000 returning citizens who were unable to vote in 2018 came out and registered to vote. And we know that over 52,000 returning citizens actually voted. They voted early, they voted on election day. And we think that's an incredible move in, in a direction that we all want to go. And, uh, and from our perspective, it, 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 it reminds us that we, we learned a lot in this past election cycle. We saw, for instance, that, that if you take those 52 plus thousand returning citizens, and then you look at who lives with them, we saw over 150,000 new voters in those same households come out. Um, so you saw 200 plus thousand more voters in the returning citizens' homes from, who, who were unable to vote in Amendment 4. And that makes all the sense in the world to us because we know what it's like to not want to talk about voting, to not want to share that you have a felony conviction, to be cynical and to just poo-poo all of the political process. And then what the opposite is, like when you get a chance to vote and you're grabbing every friend you know and every family member you know, like, let's go to the polls, let's go to the polls, let's go to the polls, you see the power of democracy in 
in action. And we got to see that. I, I will say that there's some, some unique pieces to this conversation that, that we need to keep in mind as we move forward, um, because uh, it's important to be fully educated on, on the processes at, at, at play as it relates to who is and is not eligible to vote. Because I know the league gets involved in these conversations at the local level, at the state level. And, and what we, we've found is important to remind people on this journey together is that there are also nearly 100,000 returning citizens on the voter rolls who got there before Amendment 4, right? So when we look at this constituency who is currently registered, there's about 200,000 returning citizens already on the rolls, but only about half of them signed up after Amendment 4. The, the, the 100 plus thousand that are on the rolls before that actually got their voting rights restored through clemency, right? And the clemency process did not require anybody to pay those those fees, those costs, some of those financial obligations. So we made with the league, with others, made a concerted effort to let all the supervisors of elections office know like, hey, if you're moving in this process, you need to move correctly. If you pull up somebody who happens to be a returning citizen and you think just because it's, there's a database that shows that they owe some sort of money on a clerk of courts database, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not qualified and you shouldn't take action to remove them because you might be removing somebody who's actually a voter who's been voting for a while. And so we know that there's some, some pieces to this that we all need to kind of con to continue to put together and move in unison towards a more vibrant democracy, towards a democracy in which so many more of the 1.4, 1.5 million returning citizens are on the rolls and actively engaged. And we see that happening in the, in the upcoming cycle. We see the lessons that we've learned uh, around how best to connect with returning citizens in the community and, and how to move through these systems and change these systems uh, where we can to, to ensure that we can have a more vibrant democracy in which more returning citizens participate. Um, and so with that being said, I, I open this up to questions or anything else that we would wanna talk about, but we believe this is a great moment to get involved in the next season of this. In fact, I'll tell you, we, uh, our, our bus, Cecile, you'll love this. So we've done two bus tours. We did a bus tour in 2018 before the passage of Amendment 4. We did a bus tour for the last three months of 2020 to encourage people to get out and vote um, and to register people to vote. And our bus just showed up for 2021. And we know that second chance month is in April and we're very excited to be traveling around to all the communities in the state of Florida and connect with people who had their fines and fees paid. Give them their receipts and show them the verification that they actually have all the paperwork they need to make an informed uh, decision about registering to vote and becoming more engaged in democracy. And we know that this is just a step in the process to the full empowerment of returning citizens in our state that the democracy opens our eyes to the fact that there are people with felony convictions who can't get jobs because, because of that. They can't get access to housing because of that. They can't move forward with opportunity, access capital or access higher education because of that. And we believe that the, the spirit of Amendment 4 was the simple idea that when a debt is paid, it's paid. And that means when you're done with your sentence, you should be treated like anybody else in our community. And we'll just keep fighting uh, alongside y'all and so many others to, uh, until, we, until we meet that goal. Well, thank you, Neil. Um, it, the level of complexity of this uh, is, is amazing. And um, I, li I like your books on the back there, uh, the showcase. I have a couple of questions and then we'll take some from the, um, the chat box. Um, uh, Neil, um, and, and it was really good to hear about the, the you know, the, the significant others, the people that are with the returning citizen also getting excited about being able to vote. Um, what, but I, I, if you've been disenfranchised for a while, uh, it seems to me, and especially with the complications that have arisen, that there's a significant uh, possibility of developing apathy or a huge fear factor. Um, what can be done or what has been done to help with that, to encourage people to move forward and take part in the voting? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 think, I think you touched on a couple couple pieces there. Uh, one is is just the simple awareness that people have their, their voting rights uh, restored. Uh, it really became apparent to us. In fact, we had a, 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 a Juneteenth style event 
across the state last year. Um, and it seemed very symbolic to exactly the situation that uh, uh, brought on the, the Juneteenth celebration after the passage of the Emancipation Proclamation by uh, uh, President Lincoln, uh, in which two years later, there were still people in Texas who did not know that they had been freed. We are seeing the same thing where you, there is a process in which people do not still know that they have they have uh, had their voting rights restored. So some of that is the simple, straightforward acknowledgement and understanding that, yes, Amendment 4 passed and yes, it's real. And yes, you now have the ability to vote. So there, there's some basic lines that need to be crossed in terms of just awareness and, and, and fundamental education. I, I do think that once that switch is flipped um, and, and people began to see their involvement in their community in a way that they haven't seen it before, um, you see the excitement level go up. Um, so our goal as an organization and, and, and why we're so grateful to work with the league the way we do is that we're engaged in long-term relational work. We're engaged in relational organizing with individuals who are returning citizens, communities and family members around returning citizens, um, because we believe that that's the healthiest and the best way to grow and focus on our North Star, which is the full empowerment of returning citizens in the state of Florida. So we avoid transactional style uh, you know, voter registration efforts or contact with people. I think that uh, returning citizens in particular are pretty sensitive to that. I know that I've been in a bunch of meetings where I, I remind people that I'm like, hey, man, if you knocked on my door, said, hey, I understand you're a felon, I wanna register you to vote. I'd probably ask you who you are and be like, man, I'm gonna vote against you, right? Because I think there's this idea mm -hmm. of not wanting to be treated as a vote and, and, and rather being treated as a person. And so those are the kind of things that we encourage people to kind of think of and, and, and utilize the FRRC because there are voter drives and there are great things that are going on. You mentioned, uh, you know, you can do some work with this local supervisor. So it's like, you know, they, I can imagine events where returning citizens, are gonna sh returning citizens are gonna show up and we can be that outlet where it's like, hey, register to vote get connected with his organization. They're all returning citizens at the, who are, that are leading the effort, the membership of returning citizens. This is a place that you belong, that you could you know, grow in. So uh, that, that would be my answer is a little bit of a hand in glove approach uh, to make sure that when we're dealing with returning citizens, we're focused much more on the longer term journey that people are on uh, rather than kind of a shorter term transactional style of uh, voter registration. Thank you. Um, Cecile, I, there, um, I have a question for you, but there's another question that, that kind of relates to it. Um, uh, how it will the, um, uh, the current HR1, the, um, get the title here, um, the um, For the People Act, how will that impact uh, the, the returning sitting citizen voting rights if that passes? in Florida, and then also from Vicki Waters, what bills are you keeping an eye on in the current legislature relating to returning citizens? Okay. Um, first, let me say that uh, we concur with uh, what Neil was saying, and the League had a partnership that many of you participated in with the ACLU, where we ended up uh, calling, texting, or postcarding several times persons who um, had were returning citizens who had no financial obligations. They had completed their sentence. And what we learned um, is that many of them did not know that they could vote. Because think about it, if you could not vote for so long, you stop reading the paper. You stop you know, listening to the news. It's not something that pertains to you. You're much more you know, looking at what hits your life and what things that you can, you can be involved with. So out of the approximately 250,000 people that were contacted, um, about a third of them did register to vote. So the league really made a big, a big difference there. And a, a good portion of those people actually voted. So again, some of them might have registered to vote before they were contacted by league members. And Neil, we, 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 we kept in mind what you said, but what we did, instead of saying, you, we know you're a returning citizen, we said something like, share the good news, because a lot of people didn't know. And we had like pictures of family members. You may have seen some of the postcards, but we felt that they were very representational of all different types of families. We had different colors, different ages. And in the, the postcard said, um, voting can impact someone you love. And then we just gave them again, the information. I think we, uh, FRC and then our numbers. 
And we, we got those, that's how we got those phone calls. But a lot of people did not know as we were communicating with them. So I will affirm what you said. There's a huge education piece that we've got to figure out. And we were all slowed down because of COVID. Just when we were ramping up, you got to stay remote, which, you know, a lot of people don't have financial means. They're not on the internet. They don't have personal laptops and things. So sometimes the people, groups of people that you would really want to get knock on their door or have a community event or work with their church. A lot of that was to the wayside because of COVID, but that's in the answer to the, the an additional response to the question with Petunil. With regards to HR1, it is a sprawling bill that's very exciting. Um, the biggest thing that I think it would do for returning citizens, it would return the preclearance so that the states that had a history of being racist and uh, directly oppressing and suppressing the vote, they would have to, the, what they would do would have to be reviewed before it could be implemented. And it would take away the burden of having to sue everybody for everything they're doing, which is a tool that's available to us. And the league has not been fearful of using that tool when needed, but it is cumbersome and it does take a lot of time it would be so much better if they got the pre-clearance back where the Department of Justice would look and see what are the impacts. And I think with the, the vote by mail and things of that nature, um, I had not heard, and I, it's pretty new out there, I had not heard of a provision that specifically addressed returning citizens. And it may be embedded in there, but I would say this, the opening up of pathways to voting whether it be vote by mail, automatic registration, um, things of that nature, that could be something that would directly could directly impact returning citizens. Because once they were declared to be able to vote, they could be registered to vote automatically and get a card. Because again, we have found a lot of them don't know that they can register to vote. So an automatic voter registration process tailored to finding out what sentences are completed could, could be a boon, could be really address a lot of how do you educate people about a right that they were told they would never have for the rest of their lives. Now, with regards to bills that we are watching that pertain to returning citizens, Senator Brandis has a bill called Senate Bill 662. And it's very interesting, Neil, I don't know, if, uh, it's not gotten a lot of track, but yeah, I know you guys keep up with Brandis pretty well. But that's the one where it would allow a state attorney, the prosecutor, to go into court and petition but to change a sentence downward, could never add to the sentence. And the, the rationale in the proposed bill is to, for equity, because unfortunately, different people get different sentences for almost the same crime. And so it's a way for the state to kind of like self-correct, you know, and try. So that's, that's, that's awesome because it, it could impact a, a lot of people. And, and a, because I've heard many, many times, and there've been studies that show the poor, and if you're black or brown, you end up usually with a much heavier sentence. And there's already a difference in enforcement, law enforcement, you're targeted to start with. And then when you get caught, you're gonna get a bigger you know, hit. So that, that would be great. Senator uh, Thurston, has a bill, 1418, I don't believe it's had a committee uh, review and it may not, 1418, and that was to basically remove the requirement to have to pay your fines and fees. Um, there's another bill and the number has escaped my mind, but it's out there and it, it says that, um, There's another bill that is a, has a potential to be halfway decent, and that is, is it's trying to get a state uh, sort of repository of sentences so that everybody would know. You could look there to see, you know, what you had to pay or do to be able to vote. Um, one of the recommendations that we said is there needs to be a way for returning citizens to challenge it because they may have receipts and records or have a witness because with restitution, it was perfectly lawful and expected. Many people paid restitution to the person they had injured. 
So if, if you had a DUI and you hit someone in a broken arm, you would send a check to them or bring money to them. And the court would have no record of that whatsoever. So there's a lot of external things that returning citizens might have information about. So those are several of the ones that, that has our attention. Are you watching any, Neil? <laughs> yeah, says, yeah, we're engaged. Yeah, we are engaged with Senator Rodriguez on uh, making sure that database. The database one, yeah. Looks what, out what, for the returning citizens. And we're engaged with Brandis on the resentencing bill and, and appreciate Thurston. Uh, like, yeah, I mean, that, that that's where we'd all love to land, right? Right. So. So um, we are we we are getting closer to the end. So I'm going to hop to one question that I'd like both of you to answer because this effort is not limited to the League of Women Voters. So um, so how can someone get engaged in supporting this work? So both from the League and from the. Uh, the organizations that are supported, Let My People Vote, and uh, the, the returning citizens organizations. Uh, let's start with Neil. Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting you say that because because one of the things that I, uh, when I'm, I was just with a church group a couple of days ago, and the question gets asked, and, and, and one of the first things I say is, is that we actually are working with the league, and that this attorney assistance program um, that allows us to get assistance for returning citizens and also allow us to take this what we think is a very strategic next step to get these modification motions uh, into the various judicial districts is a vital next step so that if people would be willing to engage Cecile and her efforts we think that that is an, that, that, that there, there are a few things that could be more helpful to the cause of returning citizens than engaging right there uh, right now. Um, and so that's what I told the church group. It, this is all internal for y'all, so I don't know how you guys do your communication, um, but that's that's definitely a piece. Uh, we're also pretty excited about where we're uh, beginning to roll out a kind of a, uh, a training kind of effort, FRCU is what we're calling it, uh, in which we want to proactively engage returning citizens, family members uh, to help take those next steps. Uh, we, we know that sometimes there's a uh, kind of a social network gap. Sometimes there's a training gap. Sometimes there's, you know, an effort that, uh, you know, maybe others, others that like, hey, the state could be doing some things. Some other folks could be doing some things. But if you know kind of our, you know, our leadership, how we're oriented. You got a bunch of folks who've really just learned through the course of their life, like, hey, I, I gotta work twice as hard to get half as far and I'm cool with that. So we're, we're just gonna do, do some of that ourselves for now, you know? And so I think that's an exciting next effort is to help people get trained in whatever their next step is um, as it relates to like political advocacy, as it relates to job training, as it relates to, you know, other areas of their life. So that's, that's something that's really gonna be coming alive with us and then also to help us with our second chance um, uh, tours that's going to be happening during second chance month. So if anybody were to want to connect with FRC through our website, we'd love to talk with folks about what that, that whole tour is going to look like. It's going to be a lot of fun, but it's really going to be about making sure that people who've had their fines and fees paid or want to have their fines and fees paid, uh, that they, they, they're connected and that they can move forward with confidence and clarity. <laughs> um, and Cecile? Uh, well, um, what we would like people to do is our ask is uh, reach out to any of your attorney friends. If you're an attorney, um, get involved with our CLE and volunteer with us. Um, we're also looking to get volunteers to help do some of the outreach to the returning citizens when they call us or send us their email. Uh, there's work just connecting with them again because oftentimes they have shift work and it requires a lot of phone calls and emails as, as I, I see my friend Barbara's here on the I didn't realize you were on this particular call Barbara but when I called out your name earlier but there you are and um, so we we can we can utilize that help um, we also if you know of any returning citizens or please share the information about us and about the FRC um, we are looking for re-entry programs, whether they be privately run, church, synagogue, 
a mosque one, you know, there's a lot of religious organizations get involved because they believe they don't believe in throwaway people. They want they want people to have that next opportunity to for redemption and to get on their feet. They could be private, they could be religious oriented, they could be state. But a lot of them, as we've done a lot of outreach with our intern, they are brand new to this concept. They know the law is there, but like Neil said, they don't know how to implement. So we have created a whole set of tools to address different levels of people wanting to be involved. So giving us that information of what's going on in your community, creating an event once COVID is over, like a community event where we can maybe partner with FRC and have FRC there and the league and just like put your arms around people holistically, but also do some training, train the trainer, so to speak. So there's a lot of different things that going in the future that we could we could utilize your help. Thank you. Thank you so both of you so much. It's been quite an enlightening program. Uh, it's inspirational, uh, hopeful as one of our speakers. We are recording this. And uh, we post it on our video page and it will be as one of our a highlighted video and our what we send out. And uh, Cecile, I'm gonna touch base with you on what all the links should be. I've copied it from the chat box, but okay. you, you, I'd like you to say, no, add this or you know, sure. that one out and that would be great so that everybody can get all these links. So it'll be both in our MailChimp, uh, post a once weekly thing and also it will be on our video page. Yeah, and Neil, um, send her your contacts too for the FRC. Okay. So, there were people, you know, we're just working hand in glove. Like I said, and tomorrow we actually have a meeting to see how we could work even more in intertwined. So we're yeah. always give a shout out to the fabulous work that you all do. And there is nobody out there that literally sees the returning citizen as a whole person. And I direct people to you for that reason, because yes, voting is essentially critical and it does raise people's hopes and hearts, but there's so much more to the experience of getting on your feet and lifting your head up and seeing others like yourself, you know, as a role model, you know, there's, you guys bring that and the league, you know, we're, we're doing the other things that are important, but that's critical to the whole person being supported. So we um, recognize your unique and very essential role and we enjoy working with you and co continue. Well, I'm back at you, Cecile, and thank you for everything. And, uh, and I will, I'll make sure to get the information uh, uh, over to you, Alice. And also Tracy Washington, who's our local chapter leader, uh, returning citizen, she's astounding. She's uh, um, you know, just a wonderful local leader there in the Manatee uh, County area. So I'll, I'll make sure to include her information as well. Okay. Now, that's Thank you again. And uh, for this and more information or to join the League of Women Voters of Manatee County, go to our website, lwvmanatee.org. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. See you later, Cecile. Okay.